Good morning. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I had a rather interesting text message exchange with Bill Jeffries this week. On Wednesday, Bill texted me to confirm that I was still good to go this coming Tuesday for the Second Harvest Food Packing event at the Charlotte Convention Center. Of course, if you've ever received a text from Bill, you know it came with lots of single initials instead of words. Anyway, I, initial, I initially replied back by asking what time was the event. Bill said it was the same time as we've done before, 1 to 4 o'clock. I said, well, that sounded good, and I thanked him. He replied, got you in the lineup. U, of course, was just the letter U, but got you in the lineup. Well, just to have a little fun and cause Bill to smile, I responded, not at the police station, right? Now, Bill and I share a common background in the practice of law, so I thought he might find my reply mildly amusing. Well, evidently not, because he replied, no, at the convention center. <laughs> now, I'm not as nearly concerned about Bill's lack of humor in this case as I am about what it says about me or what Bill thinks about me, because evidently he took it for granted that I might be called down to the police station for a criminal lineup. Our word choice can be important, and sometimes words or phrases can be interpreted differently depending upon the circumstances. There's a term in today's gospel lesson from the 14th chapter of John that carries a variety of meanings. It's, in Greek, it's parakletos, frequently transliterated as the paraclete. This is the name given to the Holy Spirit, and it can be translated in English as the advocate, counselor, comforter, helper, mediator, intercessor, teacher, or witness. The NRSV chooses the, the term advocate in John's gospel, reminding us that the Holy Spirit advocates for us before God the Father, much as an attorney, as an advocate for his or her clients in a court of law. The NIV, on the other hand, goes with counselor, which makes it clear that the Holy Spirit guides us through life and the challenges of life when we pay attention. And the King James Version has comforter, telling us that God's Spirit helps us through those difficult moments in life. N.T. Wright notes just how comforting the presence of another person can be when we suffer tragedies or grief. Even if the other person doesn't change a thing about the circumstances, just their being there with us can bring immeasurable comfort and hope. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about here. God in the person of the Holy Spirit does this for us. Even when grieving, we persons of faith can experience peace knowing that God is present with us. The paraclete does all of these things for the people of God and more. In the United Methodist Book of Discipline, you know it's going to be an exciting sermon when the preacher starts quoting from the Book of Discipline. <laughs> In the Discipline, it states that we, meaning we Methodists, but I suspect most Christians would agree, share the Christian belief that God's redemptive love is realized in human life by the activity of the Holy Spirit, both in personal experience and in the community of believers. Salvation comes in and through Jesus Christ, but we experience God's grace each and every day by the actions of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our hearts and minds. Bishop Will Willimon talks about this in a book titled United Methodist Beliefs, in which he says, it is the work of God in the Holy Spirit to initiate faith in us, to nurture faith, and to bring faith to its full fruition to perfect us in love. The Holy Spirit is God perfecting what God begins in us through the Holy Spirit and what God shall finally bring to complete fruition and consummation in us in the Holy Spirit, he says. This past week I asked participants uh, in, my, in the Disciple Bible 2 or Disciple 2 Bible study that I facilitate to share descriptive terms for the Holy Spirit with which they were familiar. And many of those I stated beforehand were offered. Later I received an email from one of the members of the class who added another, my compass. 
my compass. I really like that. I interpret that to mean that God gives us direction and is always true north, so to speak. No matter where we are in the world or in life, my compass, the Holy Spirit, is always pointing us with certainty in the right direction toward the truth, Jesus Christ. This is all wonderfully encouraging for us today. But when the disciples were gathered with Jesus in the upper room, as depicted by John in today's gospel text, they were not so comforted. In fact, they were very worried by what Jesus had told them moments before. Now you see him, now you don't, is what they could soon say about Jesus, as he told them he wouldn't be around much longer. He also said one of them would betray him. And that even Peter would deny knowing him three times before the rooster crowed in the morning. Jesus was trying to comfort his closest followers as he prepared to leave them. Chapters 13 through 17 of the fourth gospel are commonly referred to as the farewell discourse for this reason. So how can you be consoled when the person whom you love is about to leave you? The best and most comforting words Jesus could give to his disciples were that he wasn't actually leaving them at all, that he would still be with them even here on earth, but in another form, as another person of the Holy Trinity. I will ask the Father, he said, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Here's where Jesus first refers to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete in the Gospel of John. The advocate or comforter or compass would be with them forever. The connection between Jesus and the Holy Spirit is underscored by an adjective Jesus uses that may go unnoticed often. He says the Father will give them another advocate, another paraclete to be with them forever. If the Holy Spirit is another paraclete, then Jesus must also be an advocate, a counselor, a comforter. Because of the nature of the Holy Trinity, because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one, then Jesus really is not leaving the disciples because he will continue to be present with them through the Holy Spirit. One paraclete, now another, will be with them always. This is the spirit of truth, Jesus adds, whom the world doesn't see or know, but whom the disciples do know, because he abides with you and he will be in you, Jesus says to them. He now refers to the spirit, which in Greek is pneuma and which can be translated as wind or breath. It's interesting that Jesus notes by contrast that the world can't see or know the spirit of truth. But can the disciples anymore see the spirit? Well, maybe not directly when we think of seeing as merely visualizing physically, but with eyes of faith, they are able to see the movement of the spirit among us, much as you and I can see the wind blowing by virtue of its effect on the trees and the leaves. Would anyone doubt the presence of the wind in the midst of a hurricane? We may not physically see the wind itself, but we know it's there in full force by its effect on objects. Once again, we see the importance of how a term is interpreted or understood. When we bear in mind this meaning of the word spirit, then our eyes can be opened to a rich new understanding of the Holy Spirit and of how the Spirit moves in our lives powerfully at times, often unpredictably. We may not see the pneuma, but we can certainly see how, like the wind, the Spirit is present among us and how the Spirit affects us as people of faith. Okay, well, some of you might be thinking, I can see the effect of the Holy Spirit around me on other Christians or in the church, but what about inside me? Jesus said the spirit of truth abides with us and will be in us. How do I really know the spirit is within me? Henry Nouwen has something interesting to say that I think applies here. He writes, when we speak about the Holy Spirit, we speak about the breath of God breathing in us. He then says what I've already noted about one meaning of pneuma being breath. And he then continues, 
We are seldom aware of our breathing. It is so essential for life that we only think about it when something is wrong with it. The Spirit of God is like our breath. God's Spirit is more intimate to us than we are to ourselves. Let me repeat that. God's Spirit is more intimate to us than we are to ourselves. We might not often be aware of it, but without it, we cannot live a spiritual life. It is the Holy Spirit of God who prays in us, who offers us the gifts of love, forgiveness, kindness, goodness, gentleness, peace, and joy. It is the Holy Spirit who offers us life that death cannot destroy. Let us always pray, come Holy Spirit, come, he concludes. On May 24th, 1738, something will mark a week from now. John Wesley experienced the Holy Spirit within him as he felt his heart strangely warmed while attending a church society or small group meeting that evening on Aldersgate, Aldersgate Street in London. In that moment, he felt an inner assurance that Jesus had taken away his sins and had saved him personally, even him. This was God the Holy Spirit within Wesley's heart. That sudden experience, like the wind blowing unexpectedly and seemingly out of nowhere, had a most significant effect on him and his faith, changing him forever. Still, however, my hunch is that some of you might still be thinking, that may be true of the great John Wesley, but what about me? I hear and read about such pillars of the faith who have such amazing experiences and I hear other Christians around me who claim to feel the power of the Holy Spirit, but I can't really say that I do all that much. What about me? Am I missing something? How can I be assured of the Holy Spirit within me? Jesus gives us the answer in today's scripture, although it may not be obvious at first. The gospel passage begins with Jesus declaring, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And it ends with his saying, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Making these two statements inverted bookends. Our love for Jesus is tied up in our keeping his commandments obeying him, in other words. That's how we experience the love of the Father and Jesus' love, he concludes. And what does Jesus not say here? He doesn't say anything about feeling something inside. He does declare in between these bookending statements that soon the disciples will know that he is in the Father and that they are in him and that he is in them. But that doesn't mean that they'll have some sort of warm feeling. He doesn't promise that their hearts will be strangely warmed as was John Wesley's. Wesley had a genuine experience with the Holy Spirit which he evidently did feel within his heart. But that isn't the only way for the Spirit to move within you. The key is not emotion but rather action. The key is not emotion but rather action. Those who keep Christ's commandments are those who love him, he says, and they're the ones who experience God's love. If we want to be assured of our connection to God, if we want to experience fully his love and enjoy a deep and meaningful relationship with God and all that comes with it, then what I take away from what Jesus says is that we shouldn't wait around for some special feeling to well up in our heart. No, instead we should do something. We should obey Christ's commands, and that means doing as he did, loving God and loving others, no matter how or what we may feel. I mentioned one giant of the faith in John Wesley. Let me name another. Mother Teresa is perhaps the most well-respected Christian of the 20th century, even having been given sainthood by the Roman Catholic Church. This nun with such a gentle and kind spirit devoted most of her life to serving the poor and marginalized, especially in Calcutta, India. She was not Indian herself. She was born in Macedonia, but she felt led to helping those who were destitute in that part of the world. No one would deny that she was a woman of remarkable Christian faith. Following her death, however, 
We learned from her personal writings that she often struggled with doubt regarding her faith. Saint Teresa was plagued by doubts for much of her life that cast darkness over her walk with Jesus. In other words, she didn't always feel her faith within. Her heart wasn't continually warmed as was John Wesley's at Aldersgate. By the way, nor was his. His diary reveals his own struggles with doubt, I believe just a few days after Aldersgate. Yet in spite of her doubts, Mother Teresa never gave up and never stopped serving the poor and hurting of Calcutta. She never stopped loving Jesus and thus she never stopped experiencing the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in her life. The Spirit of Truth always abided with her and was always in her as Jesus promised to his disciples. Even in the midst of her struggles with doubt, she remained in Christ and he in her as he promises. Forgive me for turning to Father Richard Rohr two Sundays in a row, but this past week he wrote about 14th century English mystic Julian of Norwich whose revelations of divine love, I believe, is the oldest surviving work by a woman in the English language. In the 53rd chapter, Julian speaks of oneing, spelled O-N-E-I-N-G, oneing with God. This beloved soul was preciously knitted to God in its making, she writes, by a knot so subtle and so mighty that it is oneed with God, in God. In this oneing, it is made endlessly holy. Furthermore, God wants us to know that all the souls with, which will be saved in heaven without end are knit in this knot and oneed in this oneing and made holy in this holiness. Julian makes clear the intimacy of our relationship with God in which we are one with God. And Jesus is telling us how to accomplish that, how to enjoy that, how to experience that. Jesus' commandment is to love, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as we do ourselves, all others, to love unconditionally, to love uncompromisingly, to love compassionately, to love generously, to love sacrificially, to love the unlovable, to love when not loved in return, to love when you don't feel like loving, to love when you're happy, to love when you're sad, to love when you doubt, to love to love, to love. That's how we'll know that the spirit of truth abides with us and is in us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.